St. John's Gospel, chapter 13 and verse 1. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. In many ways, this one verse from St. John's Gospel sums up the whole meaning of our Lord's passion and death. Though I think I'm tempted to say that after listening to Peter and Anne introduce those hymns, there hardly seems a need for me to preach. Uh, I thought it was so um, astonishingly beautiful to listen to you speak about those hymns um, and how they have shaped your own life as disciples of Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you so much for that. At the beginning of John's Gospel, you may remember that bit right at the very, very beginning uh, where John the Baptist sees Jesus and he says, look, there is the Lamb of God. Look, there is the Lamb of God. And uh, when people heard John say that, I think they would pretty quickly be able to fill in some of the missing pieces to know what Lamb of God might mean. And those of us schooled in the Christian tradition uh, might also know what Lamb of God might mean. And although, yes, this is a sombre evening as we gather to look at the cross, but please forgive me just one funny story uh, which helps make the point. Um, uh, I think, I like to think it's a true story, but I'm not sure. I think it's a true story of some uh, Jesuit missionaries who go to an island in the South Pacific to bear to them the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, they arrive in this island and of course they don't know the language or the culture of this island so before they can do anything else they've got to really live among and it's an incarnational model of mission they need to learn the language of these people a few years go by and they have learned the language they have learned the culture they live alongside these people and slowly they start unfolding of the gospel of Jesus Christ to them and in due course after many years people in this community respond to Christ and a church is formed. It's a wonderful story um, of incarnational Christian mission. However, as the Christian community is established and so they reach a point where they need to translate the Bible and the liturgy into the language of this little uh, Pacific island, they encounter a problem. On this island there are no sheep and on this island there have never been any sheep. And as I'm sure you know, the way that language works, um, if there are no sheep, there is no word for sheep. Uh, no need for a word for sheep. And you don't need to know much about the Christian faith to know that this is going to present some hermeneutical problems um, as you come across certain key words and ideas like, look, there is the Lamb of God, or Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, or I am the Good Shepherd, I know my sheep, and so on and so on. So what do these missionaries do? Well, uh, on this island there were a lot of pigs. <laughs> And in the ancient religion of the island, there was also, you know, some tradition of sacrifice of pigs. And so that's what they did. And as far as I know, to this day, if you went to mass on that island, um, when it got to a key bit in the liturgy, the choir would rise and sing, 
oh piglet of God, <laughs> that takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Uh, Jesus is the good pig farmer. I know my pigs, and my pigs know me. And of course we, you know, we, we kind of smile. We smile when we hear this. Some of us perhaps don't smile because we think, oh, it actually feels a little bit, a little bit kind of inappropriate to be laughing at this sort of thing. But I tell the story for two reasons. First of all, it's a good way of getting ourselves imaginatively into the mindset of those who are quite outside the church. We sit here and we smile, oh how very, very funny, oh piglet of God that takes away the sins of the world. But just imagine, somebody who walks through this door tonight, who knows nothing about the Christian tradition, who's never ever been to church in their lives, they're going to find, oh Lamb of God, quite a funny thing to be saying. Um, or, or, or that extraordinary biblical image, the lamb upon the throne. What does that conjure up uh, in the mind of someone who's never been to church? Perhaps we won't go there. <laughs> um, uh, and the second reason I say it is, is even the biblical language itself needs unpacking. It is not necessarily or self-evidently the case even for those of us who go to church. What does it mean to say that Jesus is the Lamb of God? Well, the first thing uh, that those listening to John the Baptist say those words, I think the first thing they would have thought of is the Passover Lamb. And let me quickly rehearse the story of the Passover. I'm sure many of you know it, but some of you may not. Uh, the people of Israel in slavery in Egypt, pleading with Pharaoh that he might let them go. And eventually, uh, God sends an angel of death to strike the firstborn of the people of Egypt. It is a bloody horror of a night. And the people of Israel are told to sacrifice a lamb, to eat that lamb in haste, because tonight is the Passover of the Lord, and to paint upon the lintels of the door the blood of that lamb. And the angel of death, seeing the blood of the lamb, will pass over them, and they will be spared. And to this day, the Jewish people at their most solemn festival remember their deliverance from slavery as they celebrate the Passover. Straight away, Jewish people hearing one person say of another person, he is the Lamb of God. That would be quite a shocking and blasphemous thing to say. They would think of the Passover Lamb. Or they might think of those prophecies of Isaiah where Isaiah speaks mysteriously of a servant who suffers and is like a lamb silent before its shearers. Or going further back into scripture, perhaps they might think of that terrible story of Abraham and his son Isaac. Again, let me rehearse the story in case you don't know it. Um, Abraham, the great father of the Jewish people, is asked by God to sacrifice his son. And Abraham and Isaac set off uh, ready for sacrifice. Um, they prepare an altar. And then in those uh, terrible words, Isaac says to his father, Father, here is the fire, here is the knife, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And just as Abraham raises the knife to kill the boy, he hears the Lord speaking to him. No, save the boy. I will provide a lamb 
for the sacrifice. At that moment, Abraham sees a ram caught in a thicket and he believes that is what God means. They take the ram, they sacrifice the lamb and now we fast forward. Fast forward hundreds of years to, well, to the refuse pit outside the city walls in Jerusalem. Have you noticed in St John's Gospel how St John keeps on telling you what the time is? He's kind of, seems to be forever looking at his watch. He tells you it's the third hour, it's the ninth hour, it's the twelfth hour. Keeps on telling you there's a reason. There's a reason. St John wants you to know that as Jesus dies upon the cross, it is the precise hour, the precise hour, that the Passover lambs are being sacrificed in the temple. Those words that the Lord spoke to Abraham are now fulfilled in painful detail. No, not, not Abraham's son that has to be sacrificed. No, not your son, not my son. But God himself provides the lamb for the sacrifice. And Jesus himself willingly goes and, well, as St John puts it, right at the beginning of the Passion narrative, he loves them to the end. Having loved his own who were in the world, now he shows us what love looks like. And then all those other strange episodes in the Holy Week narrative begin to fall into place. Um, often greatly misunderstood. I mean, Jesus, for instance, arriving into Jerusalem on a donkey is greatly misunderstood. And people think, oh, how very humble of him to come in on a donkey rather than a white charger. No such thing. No such thing. Jesus is quite deliberately and quite specifically in his own person fulfilling one of the great messianic prophecies from Zephaniah, that when the Messiah comes, he will come riding on a donkey. And then he goes to the temple and overturns the tables of the money changers. And we kind of imagine to ourselves, well, yes, I'm sure that's a very good idea. We've been to some cathedrals where they have a bookshop at the back or they're selling kind of religious knickknacks and trinkets. And I'm sure we shouldn't really be doing that sort of thing in church. I'm sure Jesus doesn't like it. And so that's what he's doing. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's kicking out those who are trying to make a bit of a profit on the back of the, you know, the, the holiness of the temple. Again, no such thing. The job of the temple in Jerusalem was sacrifice. Its job was sacrifice. It was a bloody horror of a place. A place of endless death. In the true and honest belief that this was the way you made peace with God. And, and, and in order to make your sacrifice, which was required of you, you had to use the temple money. So the first thing you did when you arrived was change your Australian dollars into the proper temple money. <laughs> so this wasn't a sharp practice. This wasn't something illegal. This was the legitimate business of a temple whose job was to make sacrifice. So what Jesus is doing by overturning the tables of the money changers is just for a moment, maybe for about half an hour, the legitimate work of the temple is suspended. And this is what Jesus is saying. I am the temple. I am the Lamb for the sacrifice. I am the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world, who will make peace with God. And how will I do it? 
I will do it by walking the second mile of love. All those things that Jesus said right at the beginning of his ministry about turning the other cheek, about going the second mile, all that he fulfills in his passion and in his death. I remember when I was a, when I was a little, you know how stories get told in your family kind of over and over again? Um, a story that's told in my family is apparently when I was a little boy I had a very hot temper and a very short fuse. Um, I, I'm a much amended character now as I'm sure you know, but then a hot temper, a short fuse. And um, when I used to kind of blow up, the story that's told in my family is that my mum didn't deal with this by haranguing me, by shouting at me, by telling me off, by sending me to my room, by sitting me on the naughty step. That wasn't her tactic for dealing with my, with my kind of rage. She dealt with me by holding me. And holding me. And holding me. And she would hold me until the rage subsided. And when the rage subsided, not only was I healed of my anger and my temper, I was also transformed into love. Because by the end, it wasn't just that she was holding me, I was holding her. And that's what Jesus does on the cross. That's what it means for him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who makes peace with God. He becomes the one who holds us. Um, I go into a lot of schools back home, um, and when I go into schools, they usually say, "Could you?" We've got a lot of church schools um, in England, primary schools. These little children. I go into the schools, and the schools say, "Bishop, could you come and tell the children about being a bishop?" And, and, and could you bring along all that kind of weird stuff that you wear in church? So I pitch up with a bag full of stuff. And, and I show the children all the stuff I wear. You may be interested in some of it. I wear, I wear a ring with an amethyst in it. Um, 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 I don't know whether you know what the word amethyst means. Uh, it comes from the Greek amethystos, which means I'm not drunk. Uh, in case you're wondering. Um, uh, uh, um, I, I, I wear a mitre. You know, a particularly strange hat in the shape of a flame. Uh, the amethyst and the mitre are both connected. Um, the story of Pentecost. Um, the disciples are accused of being drunk. And Peter says, we're not drunk. It's the fire of the Spirit which fills us with joy. And, and, the, and a mitre, in case you've ever wondered, is supposed to be in the shape of a flame. It's a tongue of fire on your head. And I carry a staff. Um, to show them, and then so on and so on. I show the children all my stuff. But last of all, I show them the cross. And I say to them, listen, yeah, I am a bishop, but it's not really such a big deal. The most important thing about me is not that I'm a bishop. The most important thing about me is that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And the cross is, is the sign, the badge, of what it means to be a Christian. And I say to them, from now on, whenever you see the cross, could you please do this? Could you please look at the cross? Forgive, forgive me for giving you my school assembly. I hope you, I hope you won't feel, feel patronised. Um, from now on, when you see the cross, look at the cross and say to you, in your head, say to yourself, 
God, how much do you love me? God, how much do you love me? And then I want you to imagine Jesus with his arms stretched out wide. And the simplest and best way of understanding the cross is that Jesus is saying, this is how much I love you. I have got a great big love for you and all the world. I am the God who shares your living and shares your dying. And if ever, if ever, on the pathway of life, if you are feeling lost or tired or broken or lonely, I am there for you with my arms stretched out. I want to hold you and hold you and go on holding you. And they put a crown of thorns on his head and they put a purple robe on his back and it was a fantastic joke. He said he was a king. Let's dress him up as one. And, and, uh, and uh, for, a, for, a, for, a, for a scepter, they, they pushed a spear into his side. For a throne, they gave him a wooden cross. They even put a sign above the cross saying, great joke, king of the Jews. What a great joke. Let's put it in three languages, Hebrew, Greek and Latin, so that everybody could enjoy the joke. If ever there was a joke that backfired, it was that one. And they cast lots for his clothes, and they strung him up on the cross, and they laughed at him, and they said, uh, you saved others, save yourself. And they spat on him, and even one of the criminals there next to him made fun of him. And what did he do? What does love do? Love goes on loving, that's all. Just goes on loving, goes on holding, goes on forgiving. Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That's all. And that's what we see on the cross. We see what love looks like when it goes on loving and goes on loving and goes on loving. And in the end, all that we can do, well, sisters and brothers, we are faced with a choice. The choice is you either stick two fingers up at love or you love in return. You are tamed by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ as we see it on the cross. Love to the loveless show that they might lovely be. That is the song of the Christian church. And there was we call him the penitent thief, don't we? Um, I, I notice, however, in the Bible, the words penitent thief don't appear anywhere. That's, um, that's our little subheading, because we feel a bit more comfortable with that title. But it's a ridiculous title, isn't it? He is not the penitent thief. That's the whole point of the story. He's not the penitent thief. Um, a much better title would be The Thief in the Last Chance Saloon. That would be a much better title. <laughs> Because there isn't any penitence. If you read this, it's in Luke's Gospel. Have a look at it when you get home. There's no penitence there. One of the, one of the thieves says, well, you know, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself, save us as well. And, and, and what the other thief said, the other thief is a realist. He says, look, he says, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't, do the, you know, don't do the crime unless you can do the time. That's the kind of criminal's philosophy. And that's basically what he says, look, we're, we're getting strung up for what we did. This man has done nothing wrong. That isn't penitence. That's just realism. But there's something that he sees in Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me in that kingdom of yours. That's all. Not penitence. Not goodness. Not holiness. He simply reaches out 
He sees something in Jesus and the rage and the failing inside him is tamed by the Jesus that he sees going on loving and going on loving. And brothers and sisters, that can be the same for us. What does God ask of us? Simply that we see in Jesus God's love for us laid out in painful detail and that we say, Jesus, remember me in that kingdom of yours. A few other little things, a few other little things. Then I promise I'll stop. Um, there, w there was a Baptist preacher um, at the beginning of the last century who whenever he preached about the cross at these big open air evangelistic rallies, whenever he preached about the cross, he would tell the story of the cross as if it were a wedding service. And it's a brilliant way of thinking about what the cross means and how we might respond. And he said it's, it's as if on the cross, God the Father is saying to Jesus, God the Son, do you, Saviour, take, and then the preacher would, I guess, eyeball the congregation, do you, Saviour, take these poor sinners to have and to hold, to love and to cherish from this day forward and forevermore? And when in St. John's Gospel Jesus says, it is finished, it is like Jesus is saying, I will, I pledge my troth to you. This is the great truth of the Christian faith, that in the death of Jesus Christ, God has done everything that is necessary to take away the sins of the world. It's a done deal. God has done everything that's necessary for us to enjoy eternal life. He pledges his troth to us because of his great love for us. But here's the point. As with a wedding service, so with the drama of salvation, the focus of attention turns from one partner to the next. And now, God the Father says, if you excuse me putting it this way, to you poor sinners. So, will you take this saviour to have and to hold, to love and to cherish from this day forward? And forevermore. And it seems to me that the whole beauty of the Christian faith is that at that point in the drama of salvation, our generous and courteous, loving God simply works. <coughs> He's not going to force you into responding. He's not to, going to stick your arm up behind your back and coerce you into responding. Why? Because it's love. God has done all this for love and that's all he wants in return and nothing less than love. He has pledged his troth to broken, beautiful humanity. And now, he waits. And as in a moment we go into the church, the invitation is to stop, to wait, to watch. Here might I stay and see. And I pray that as we wait and watch, we will carry our candle and carry a prayer about our own response to what God has done in the passion and death of Jesus Christ. That if we want to, as with last night, those of you who were here, don't worry if you won't. Once we're in the church, if you want to talk to somebody, or you'd like somebody to pray with you, if you'd like to talk about your response to the gospel, then I'll be in one of the chapels up at the right. I think Father Hugh will be... 
but Bishop Graham will be on the left, Sister Avril at the back. So come and speak to somebody or ask us to pray for you, if you wish. And fill in a card. Fill in a card um, offering to God your own response. And these cards will in turn be offered at the Mass on Sunday. So let me finish with a poem. And this is a poem, I mean it's a hard poem, because it's a poem about how we refuse the things God offers us. We see what God has done in Jesus Christ. We hear his offer of life, of forgiveness, of mercy. But something inside us just turns away from it. And it's a poem about what love goes on doing, even when we get it wrong. You offered me a broken piece of bread. I said I wanted jam and toast instead. I said the bread was useless, basic, poor. You offered me the bread and nothing more. You stood to wash the tiredness from my feet. I said, I need a bath to be complete, and not from you, so menial a chore. You stooped to wash my feet, and nothing more. You overthrew the tables in my heart. I said I like them as they are, apart. I said it politely, showing you the door. You overturned my heart, and nothing more. You held me like an etching in a press. You held me, held me, held me, nothing less.